Today, I'm very happy to talk to you about the rationale for endodontic treatment. Certainly, this uh, segment of the lecture is rarely talked about. You don't find many articles about rationale for treatment. There's very few DVDs addressing this topic, but I'm going to talk about it today because it is critical that we have a good understanding and appreciation for the rationale for treatment because it basically will influence all the physical steps that comprise start to finish endodontics. So when we talk about the rationale for treatment, really we're talking about complete access. We're talking about finding all the orifices, skillfully using small sized hand files to secure canals. And by a secured canal, I mean a canal that has a smooth reproducible glide path. If we have a glide path, then we can shape these canals and shaping allows us to irrigate more effectively. Shaping allows us to fill the root canal system brimful with a reservoir of irrigant and we can then activate the irrigant where it can exchange by circulating, penetrating and cleaning into the uninstrumentable portions of the root canal space. If we have removed everything from the root canal space, it is quite easy to use thermal softened obturation materials and rapidly and effectively mold them into this space to affect the seal. Those are the factors that would influence success. Well, I think now that we know the steps, diagnosis, access, glide path, shaping, disinfection and obturation, we need to really get a little bit more clear on what the pulp's doing and why we even need to do these steps. Many, many clinicians uh, get into trouble by placing restorations or a new uh, definitive bridge or something like that, only to find out that the patient's in pain and they're doing follow-up endodontic treatment, oftentimes through a brand new prosthesis. And what I'd like to do is just focus a little bit in this segment on what makes pulps vulnerable. And what we're going to talk about is the pulps are vulnerable because they are limited in their blood supply. There's a limited capacity to bring in blood to re initiate repair. The pulp itself is encased in unyielding dentinal walls. So when there's an injury, there's little chance for expansion of tissue during the inflammatory process because the dentin is confining this tissue. And finally, the third reason that makes the pulp vulnerable is it's a terminal circulation organ. It's like the appendix. So when the appendix blows within 24 to 48 hours, you could possibly be dead of a septicemia. And so when a pulp, quote, exacerbates or dies, it's going to go through a whole series of stages to get there, but oftentimes it has to do with inflammation, ischemia, infarction, necrosis, and pulp death. So let's look at the pulp a little bit closer today so you'll better appreciate and help you treatment plan as you visit with your new patients. There's an inset image on this graphic and at the far left side of that inset, you can see normal dentin. There are many, many dentinal tubules per every one square millimeter. It has been reported consistently that there's between 80,000 and 120,000 dentinal tubules per one square millimeter at the level of the CEJ. If you go a little bit right to the dentin, you can see that the area there that's lighter, it's a little vertical band, that's some reparative dentin. That is some dentin that's being elaborated by the next layer, and you can see the layer of odontoblast. So vertically, those odontoblasts are lined up, and those odontoblasts have processes that extend into the tubular dentin. To the right of the odontoblast is a relatively cell-free zone of while, and this cell-free zone can be seen in any non-involved pulp. Any healthy pulp has it. And then to the right of the cell-free zone of while, we have the pulp proper. And so that's how the pulp would look in health. But for most pulps that we see clinically, it's a downhill slide, and probably the pulp is never healthier during and after tooth eruption. And for most pulps, then, uh, they become subject to the various injuries that are encountered in everyday life, and that is caries and trauma. And of course, the dentistry that we do to remove the caries is in and of itself traumatic in terms of the effect on the pulp. So let's look at how this would work. 
So a younger patient can come into your office and you can see there's maybe a little bit of occlusal decay. I want you during this set of images to look very carefully at the pulp chamber and watch how it recedes, pulls down and constricts to get away from the irritant. So in this case, we have caries. So any good dentist would diagnose this and immediately remove everything and put in the restoration. If you look at the pulp after even a simple restoration, you can probably notice that in the pulp proper, the undifferentiated mesenchymal cells can undergo mitotic division. They can cross the cell-free zone of while and become second-line odontoblast. Now these odontoblasts have the opportunity to lay down reparative dentin and you can see a little bit of reparative dentin to the left of the odontoblast. So calcification is going on, it's occurring, and the pulp is getting smaller at its own expense to try to protect itself from the injury. But as is typical in life, the patient can be fine today, but with a little bit of time to intervene, oftentimes on another visit in a bite wing or a well-angulated periapical film, we can pick up that there's another area of caries. And in this case, watch the pulp chamber, but good dentistry means removing all the decay, the softened areas, down to hard dentin so we can put in a restorative. And in this instance, you can see we now have a two surface filling and the pulp chamber has pulled away. And now, histologically, you can see, even with what is considered a relatively shallow restoration, significant inflammation. Notice all the round cell infiltration into the pulp proper. Of course, patients would complain probably of cold sensitivity following the placement of this restoration because of the injury to the pulp. Well, it happens right along with regularity that oftentimes patients get into trouble again and the proximal areas seem to be vulnerable and here we have another little invasion through the enamel but notice that once the caries, the microbes, get through the harder enamel, they eat away at the softer dentin and it mushrooms out into quite a sizable lesion. So any good dentist would remove this caries and now we would have a three surface restoration. And what you'll notice in the inset image is the odontoblastic bodies, the actual cell proper, has been aspirated and sucked up into the dentinal tubules. And this organic material is now resident in the dentinal tubules. The patient's dismissed. Everything seemed to go clean clinically, but the patient could be complaining of longer sensitivity to cold, and they might even be complaining of other things as well, spontaneous pain, Sometimes as bacteria become resident in the pulp, they'll even start to complain of heat. And of course, the tooth could even be getting sensitivity to biting pressure, even though radiographically it would look clean. Well, what we need to notice is that this organic material begins to become necrotic. And these are dead tracts. And you can see that when they were stained, each dentinal tubule harbors its own population of microbes and through competitive inhibition you will not find two species of bacterium in the same tubule and this tubular contents drains so you get the egress of breakdown products into the pulp proper so the irritant and the injury is continuing well finally many of these restorations one surface two surface three surfaces finally the restorations begin to break down there's am amazing uh, challenges to these restorations. People are drinking hot liquids, cold liquids. The coefficients of expansion between the restoratives and the dentin is not the same. And marginal leakage usually can begin to occur over time. And so finally, the dentist decides to replace all those restorations with a crown. So by the time the tooth is prepared, impressions are taken, there's provisionalization, and finally later, permanent cementation of the final restoration, there's been a lot of injuries to that pulp. So anytime you're looking at a tooth that has a crown as an example on it, that usually was not the first restoration. And if we look at the inset, you can see immediately the problem is up underneath that restorative, hidden from our view, in the pulp chamber itself is a walled off abscess. So many people have abscesses 
in their pulp chambers and they're completely asymptomatic. The pulp is quiescent and they're walking around with no clinical symptomology. So that's a good thing, but we have to just understand that usually over time there's more dentistry. The dentistry is done because there's usually recurrent decay or the restoration's half-life is over and it needs to be repaired or renewed. So pulps are always insulted and we have to worry about the big three, but the frequency of injury, the magnitude of injury, and the duration of injury. Well, if all this pulp just stayed inside the root that was diseased, that would be a good thing. But the tissue does not stay resident to the root itself, but it begins to egress as it breaks down, and the breakdown is along the anatomical pathways. So what we will notice oftentimes as lesions begin to form adjacent to the portals of exit. So any communication from the pulp proper to the periodontal ligament space should be considered a conduit for the egress of irritants. And these irritants then leach out along the anatomical pathways and they give rise to lesions of endodontic origin. It should be fully understood that these lesions are not germane to the bone, they do not arise from the bone, but they arise secondary to endodontic breakdown. And of course, I want to point out that many of us are still looking regrettably just apically when we should be looking periridicularly around the root of the tooth. Because if you're looking just apically, you might deem this tooth to still be endodontically healthy. But if you begin to look periridicularly, these lesions are frequently there and they're not noticed oftentimes or they're pawned off as a periodontal lateral cyst or some other uh, pathological dilemma. So we really need to look at pulp testing in another segment so we can learn to ascertain is it an odontogenic problem or is it something non-odontogenic. But finally, breakdown becomes more complete with a little bit more time and now the whole world of dentistry can look at this tooth and say it's endodontically involved. So the breakdown to summarize is along the anatomical pathways. The egress of irritants is along the portals of exit and the lesions form adjacent to and symmetrical around those portals of exit. So we need to take well angulated films so we can better appreciate the third dimension and of course in another segment we'll even talk about cone beam uh, scans so we can be really three dimensional in our diagnostics. Well, I'll review the steps again but the rationale for treatment should parallel the extraction. The reason the extraction is so successful is it serves to remove the pulp 100% of the time. But what we'll notice in good endodontics is we need a complete access. We need to find the canal or canals. These canals need to be negotiated very carefully and secured. And once the canals are secured, they can be shaped. And fully shaped canals can be flooded with a reagent and these reagents can be activated and we can move solution through all the lateral canals out to the cable surface. This will be shown very clearly in another segment. Well, if the canal has been cleaned properly, then in fact we can remove the reagents, dry the canals, fit a cone, and we can use a thermal softened vertical condensation technique or a three-dimensional carrier-based obturation technique or a carrierless warm gutta percha technique to fill into all the anatomy. And if we do that and get a complete three-dimensional seal, the inevitability, the capacity for the bone to fill is remarkable. So in closing, we need to follow these cases over time to make sure that our work has been successful. And great endodontics means that we need to get the coronal seal. We need to protect the endodontics from bacterial invasion and recontamination. So if we have done complete endodontics, if we have the tooth properly restored, the inevitability of the bone to heal is perfectly there and it's probably one of the more predictable forms of treatment that we can do as dentists performing dental procedures. I hope you've understood this segment and how it impacts the patients you see on a daily basis. 
And in another segment, I will really emphasize the importance of diagnostics so you can identify these teeth pre-treatment. Thank you for your time, and I look forward to seeing you in another segment of Ruddle on Endodontics.